Good evening. Um, uh, two of my favorite Christmas songs was actually, one of them was what we just sang, Oh, Come, Let Us Adore Him. I love that, uh, Oh, Come, Let Us Adore Him. And that actually speaks of healing. Adoring is how Mary was actually healed of the seven demons of the, she was healed of evil spirits from adoring Christ. Oh, come, let us adore him. And uh, we had a pic beautiful picture this morning of the child that was given to us, right? Uh, unto us, a child is born. And then a son, we had the humanity and the deity of Christ. It was amazing to think about. And the other song was, uh, is, uh, I, you know, you, the little drummer boy. But he had no gifts to bring, right? But what he had, he did with all of his heart. And I just, every time I hear that song, I just love it. Because then, you know what happened? You know, like, like creation started keeping time with him. It's like that's unity. You know, it's like glory to God because everything that, whatever he was, whatever he had, he brought to God. And it just, it just changed. It changed the place where he was. And it's like he didn't become self-conscious anymore. So it doesn't matter what we have. It's like, like a little drummer boy is a great example of life. And um, um, just, I'm going to read Isaiah 9. I do, I do just want to share a testimony. It's a, it's a unique one. But do you guys know Trucker Dan? How many people know Trucker Dan? A few people, quite a few people do. You'd be blessed to see all those hands. Anyway, I was, I've been gone for about seven weeks, and I travel in a truck. And most of the time, I travel in Iowa. And uh, I had to make a trip to Indiana. And early one morning, I text Dan, and I said, where are you? And normally, he texts back real quickly, or he calls me. He's really good on the phone. And, uh, but this morning, he didn't. So anyway, i traveling down the road a little bit further, and all of a sudden, I get a call from Daniel Newman and driving down the road. He says, where are you? You know, he's a long-haul trucker, right? He travels all throughout the, you know, from, you could say, from basically from Nebraska to the East Coast. He said, where are you? I said, I'm on uh, I-75 headed east towards Indianapolis. And uh, he said, uh, what color truck you have? I said, a white one. He said, what, what mile mark are you on? I said, wait, let me drive a little bit more and see which one I'm at. I said, 138. He says, I'm at 138. He said, flash your lights. And so we flashed our lights. And all of a sudden, his whole truck just like lit up like a Christmas tree. It was all like flashing. There wasn't a car between us. He was the next truck right in front of me. And then, yeah, so we pulled off, you know, the next section, what truckers do, they have coffee, right? So he bought me a coffee. And, he, you know, his voice is like, it's like, and he was in this truck stop, like, yelling, like, how happy. And all the truckers are like, this man is strange. He's like, can you believe what just happened? You know, he was so happy. But it was amazing that that, you know, that actually happened, that there wasn't, there was nothing, you know, nobody between us, and we actually met like that. And uh, so, yeah, we were happy. But uh, um, well, maybe there's another story I just want to tell. Unto us, a child is born. Um, I, I buy fur, and uh, I travel around. And there's this one old man. His name is Boone. I don't know if I told the story before. But I bought his furs for five years now. And he's, that's his nickname, Boone. And um, you can imagine what that means. But five years ago, he, he brought me a lot of furs. And uh, he's an alcoholic. His face is all red. And, uh, you know, he, he brings them. And the first year, he didn't trust me. And that. we kind of started to trust. But 
And, but his furs are dwindling, the amount that he brings, because he's getting more and more frail. In last year, I just, like, I shared Christ with him. You know, I thought, like, this is going to be the last time I see him. And it's just like, you know, you can imagine this guy's got like, nicotine stains all through his hands. His face is all red. It's just blistery from being an alcoholic. It's just red, you know, and just like, you know, he's, he's outside and, like, it's like, you know, 10 below normally, and or it's below freezing, I'm not exaggerating, but, you know, he doesn't wear a jacket, you know, he's just one of those tough guys, but he's just getting weaker and weaker, and I shared with him Christ last year, and he received Christ, and, and, and I didn't think I would see him again, and I thought, well, it's over, you know, he's going to die, and I saw him this year, and after I bought his fur, I said, Boone, do you remember that prayer you prayed? He says, I do. And uh, I said, it's real. You have eternal life. And he said, I know. I know. And um, I was just, I'm just amazed as we adore Christ, as we adore Christ in our lives, what we get from Christ. Um, I've lost things. The sin nature has lost things for us. You know, and, and we're in an angelic conflict. And we... It's so easy to lose something. But do we realize what God wants to give us? It is, it is, um, he doesn't, like, his government shall reign forever and ever, and it will increase for, there's no end to his peace and his government increasing. It's like, he shuts every mouth, and he says, whatever competition, whatever standard you're in, however you have evaluated yourself, however you have, you know, had, had like, a report card against yourself or the report card for yourself so you're better than... None of that means nothing. And I, I was thinking that's what it means in Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Every mouth will be shut. Shut up. Quit telling me about that evaluation. Unto us, and his, unto us a child is born, and his government shall increase forever and ever. And there's no end to how it's going to increase. And that's what we live in as people. His government... Are we... And it's like, by... It's just like, what do we, we buy milk, you know, and wh why do you buy bread and uh, it doesn't satisfy? That's Isaiah chapter 55. Why do you buy something that doesn't satisfy? Like, why do, why do we live like that? Why do we live in that where our mouth is open, we're justifying ourselves, and we're, we, I, at the end of the day, I see, I have this computer, and I see my stats, you know, what I, it's like, it means nothing. Stats mean, they're, they're, they're nothing. Stats are a lie about humanity. They are a lie. They don't, they don't tell us the truth. God tells us the truth about ourselves. His government, his peace. They're like, why, why are we going to go to heaven? Why is there eternity? It's because there's no end to it. And like, this is our fullness. We don't create our fullness. The fullness is given to us. It's something that's eternal. And it's continually getting larger. And like, it's getting larger. Put that in your relationship, in your marriage, in something that you've lost. It puts an end to those lies that, are, that, that they, they, they try to minister. They're ministering lies. They speak to us. They're lies. And God has another government, another kingdom. It's a covenant. It's where whatever God says is true. Let every man be a liar. Okay. Anyways, great to be here. I just, the last thing before we pray for the offering. Came in the church today. I've been away for a while. And I saw, I saw a silhouette. I don't even know who it was. And I saw someone waving like this to someone. It was, I was so far away. I don't know. But it represented to me someone giving. They weren't like this. They were like this, giving. And I was like, I was like, wow, I'm home. I'm home. I saw that person like giving. I said, wow, that's what 
that's, you know, I'm, I'm home. I saw that, just a silhouette of a man, just like leaning with effort to like give life to somebody. I said, I'm home. So f- we're going to pray for the offering, and we give. We give. And to us, a child is, is given. John 3, 16, God gave. Christmas is about a giving the best. Father, thank you that that is our opportunity tonight to give our best to you, God, in every area of our life. Whatever we do, we can live hardly as unto you, not being pleasers of men, but pleasing you, God. We thank you and let this offering please you tonight in Christ's name. Let us do it what regularly, right, with the correct proportion, right, and then with joyfully. In Christ's name, amen.
What a great, great night already. Um, just want to share briefly um, a little recap of this morning's message, or just some points maybe that came to me from that that message. And as Pastor Gary was speaking, I was just really moved by um, the thoughts, you know, the, about. Pastor Schauer spoke this morning a little bit about the, the son being born, a child being born in Isaiah 9. And uh, when we think about that, for unto us a child is born, you know, and obviously we, we understand that a child is human, uh, but unto us a son is given. And that son obviously is the son of God. So we have this picture, this beautiful picture of the humility of Christ in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, how he humbled himself and he took upon himself the form of a servant. And he remained obedient all the way to Calvary. And uh, he was speaking about this, the two Greek words um, for a covenant. And uh, the one covenant is between an agreement between people. And then there's a second covenant covenant that is from one party to the other and I was thinking about Genesis chapter 15 when Abraham is given the Abrahamic covenant and he looks for a sign the Lord starts to tell him what to do to to prepare himself for this covenant and there's a lot of sacrifice and there's animals that are sacrificed and laid out as would be the custom actually for the eastern people there would be any time there was an agreement there was sacrificing and there was a process of walking between that sacrifice and agreeing on that covenant and uh, maybe just quickly we could turn to Genesis 15 there's just really precious verse there that it's just uh, in this season that we're in is really such a, speaks volumes to us. Uh, And I think in verse 11, to fast forward here, um, previously in in verses uh, 8 through 10, we see that the laying out of the sacrifice happens, and he took them, divided them in the midst, put one piece against the other. Um, And then in verse 12, it says, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And the beautiful thing about this covenant between God and Abraham is not only did Abraham fall asleep, but he made sure he was knocked out. Really, with a great horror of darkness. And why is that? Because then when the covenant happens, you see the picture the Lord comes and walks between the sacrifice, and he does so without Abraham being able to offer anything to the picture. It's com- he is completely knocked out of the picture. There is not one thing that he is held to in the covenant other than the complete initiation of God towards him. And this is such a beautiful picture that unto us a child is born and a son is given, And the weight of the government is upon his shoulders. You know, in this world that we live in, there's a lot of depression that happens around this time of year. Around Christmas. The most joyous season to a believer is when the world is oftentimes the most depressed. And many counselors attribute that depression, Christian counselors will attribute that depression to the fact that there is an an ignorance of... Uh, the incarnation of Christ, that Christ came, and when he took the weight of the government upon his shoulders, he completely changed the abilities for, for man to be satisfied. Before Christ initiated his life toward us, it would be impossible for us to be satisfied. And if you're giving a gift that you want to please somebody and you can't please them enough, or you receive a gift that wasn't what satisfied you and there's so much turmoil and there's so much preoccupation or we can say the prince of peace 
has performed this amazing covenant that now gives me the ability to be satisfied in my life. And the gift giving is now motivated by the love of God towards somebody else and the joy of the satisfaction of knowing that the Prince of Peace has changed the entire ordinance. All of the system of satisfaction has been changed because of his initiation of love toward us. The one-way initiation of God's love towards us. And now here we are standing in the body of Christ, fellowshipping around these promises and receiving the walk that God has given us in this season, and it becomes joy. We have just unspeakable joy, and we can sing about a baby in a manger, and in our hearts we are broken, and our, our, you know, we are just considering how incredible that the God of all creation humbled himself and took upon himself the form of a man, and he served us. He laid aside his reputation. He became, in one sense, an ordinary person so that we could be knocked out and he could go between us and God and satisfy it. And now the Prince of Peace has given us peace that, that nothing can take away and we truly can have the joy of this season because of the satisfaction of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. That was amazing. That was so good. Wow. Um, this morning's message really spoke loudly and pastor the two pastors that just shared they referred to it and what pastor Barry just mentioned I, I can't stop thinking about the message this morning it was the, just the Holy Spirit speaking to us about these things so I would like to um, actually repeat it and um, uh, just meditate on it for some time before we uh, close tonight and have our gift exchange. We also want to honor Scott Marcouche, who's here with us tonight, and his going to I is it Iowa or Idaho? Idaho to your family, Iowa, Iowa, uh, and um, uh, he just means a lot to us. So. We're going to give him a gift and uh, pray for him. <clears throat> so it's okay if I pre repeat the message this morning? Yeah, I mean, uh, we could hear it all year long. All right, so here's... Um, I had a joke at the 11 o'clock service. The people at nine didn't hear it. It's a very good one. Do you want to hear it? Yes. <clears throat> it's a very good one. The jokes are hard to find. I've given up social media for the new year, and I'm trying to make friends outside of Facebook while applying the same principles. Every day I walk down the street and I tell passerbys what I've eaten, how I feel, what I did the night before, and what I will do tomorrow. When I give them pictures, then I give them pictures of my family, my dog, and my garden. I also listen to their conversations, and I tell them I love them. And it works. I already have three people following me. Two police officers and one, one psychiatrist. Turn with me to Isaiah 9, please. Isaiah 9. <clears throat> I am so happy about Christmas. I'm so happy to be with you. 
I'm happy with the message that God has put in our hearts, what it means that God would come into this world. Isaiah 40, we don't have the time, but Isaiah 40, I'll write down the chapters for you. Isaiah 40 and 41, you can put these, 53, then 55, and then 65 and 66. And you have the Messiah coming into the world, establishing his kingdom, and a new heaven and a new earth. From Isaiah 40 to Isaiah 66, you actually have the New Testament in the Old Testament. Isaiah 40, verse 1, the very beginning there, a voice shouting, crying out in the wilderness, crying out John the Baptist in Isaiah 40, Christ suffering in Isaiah 53. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come drink milk and wine without money and without price. And then the kingdom coming on the earth in 65 and 66. Well, our God is so unique. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born. That's the human baby. Born by the genetical material of Mary, the seed of David, a human being who was of Abraham, who was of Adam, and the promise to Adam that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. Hallelujah. A child was born, verse 6, a son, the Son of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Son created heaven and earth, Colossians 1, 15. In him all things consist. He is holding all things together, Hebrews 1, verse 3, who being in the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, who by his own blood um, took away, purged us of our sins, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. A child is born, a son is given. And not a son like any other son, but the Son of God eternally begotten, meaning he never had a beginning, always was with the Father, always will be. And this Son of God became a child. Verse 6, And the government shall be upon his shoulder. We said this morning that to shoulder the government. What government? The government of the entire universe. The government of all things. The government of all animals and insects. They're all operating by the laws and the ordinances of God. Of all the planets and all the orbiting parts and all the magnetic fields and all the particles discovered and undiscovered, all of the spirits, demonic and otherwise, angelic, all of it governed, all of it happening, and there is a part of it that is independent or wanting to be independent of God, but actually even that is subject to the sovereignty of Almighty God. But when you have a mess, and we can make it like with my coat here, and we can say there is the world, there is the sin, the rebellion, there is Satan, there is the government of evil, there is the rebellion of the human race, there is the guilt of the soul, there is the uh, self-consciousness of man, there is death and disease and cancer and the grave. God came into the mess. And he got underneath it. 
He got really low and he went way down in underneath it. And he got under it like, and he overcame it. It's like a weightlifter getting underneath it. It's like a mom or a dad getting into the mess of the family, and there it is. And Christ being able to go into the bottom of the sea where Jonah went into the fish. Uh, he's able to go like a corn of wheat, a corn, uh, the kernel of wheat, go into the ground and die. We use this illustration this morning of this man diving off a cliff. We could show that. If you can put it up there, please. Anybody sleeping? Is it up there? Hello? <laughs> there it is. C.S. Lewis wrote this. One has a picture of someone going right down and dredging the sea bottom. One has a picture of a strong man trying to lift a very big, complicated burden. He stoops down and gets himself right under it so that he himself disappears. And then he straightens his back and moves off with the whole thing swaying on his shoulders. Or else one has a picture of a diver stripping off garment after garment, making himself naked, then flashing for a moment in the air, then down through the green and warm and sunlit water, into the pitch black, cold, freezing water, down into the mud and slime, then up again, his lungs almost bursting, back again to the green and warm and sunlit water, then at last, out into the sunshine, holding in his hand the dripping thing he went down to get. This thing is human nature but associated with it all, nature, the new universe. To use this to say, unto us a child is born, who? The Son is given, here. Christ came to show us God. In Isaiah, on our screen, on our Isaiah 40, God says, Who is like me? Who is like me? There is no one like me. I cannot find any God like me. And then further, we see his humiliation. We see who has believed our report, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. He shall grow, shall grow up amongst us as a, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. And the government shall be on his shoulder. Meaning that actually we have lost, but because of him, because by illustration of the guy up here on the picture, that, that Christ became what we had never seen before. And actually, to be honest, there's no religion in the world anything like ours. Because if you take this away from our religion, then really we have nothing different. There's nothing but human effort and all of us trying to deal with our mess down here. Trying to organize ourselves and trying to be better and try to do what we're supposed to do. But it all means nothing. Pastor Gary said it. It doesn't mean anything. It's just dying people. Doing good for a while and then dying. Just sinful people. Struggling with ourselves. But the verse says... 
His name shall be called Wonderful. I feel that Christmas time. I feel, I feel and I sense it, but not just in December. I actually, all the time, wonderful. How wonderful could it be? How more wonderful I cannot imagine than that God would dive. He would come into this world and say, I got it covered. I'm going to lift the heavy burden. I'm going to get under it. And I'm going to take it and death itself. And anything that happens in time and space, I am God. And I have overcome it. I have faced it. I bore it up. I carry it with me. And the government of God is on my shoulder. And my government, that government will increase, it says, of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. Our sisters and brothers have gone to heaven. Sometimes I think about them. How they talk with each other at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How they are in fellowship with the angels. How they've gone to a city whose builder and maker is God. How they walk on that street of gold how things are transparent, how things are incredibly marvelous, how they understand the mind of God, how God has favor with them, how God speaks to them, how God carries them. It would all be virtually impossible. It would be a fairy tale. It would be a fantasy. It would be something that we wouldn't be believing in except He came. And His name is Wonderful. Amazing name. It is wonderful. I mean, to be an old man and to say, it is wonderful. Like I can see a child discovering an animal. A seven-year-old finding a don looking at a donkey for the first time. Dad, it's amazing. I can see a scientist marveling at some discovery. But I cannot see an old man who's lived his years bright eyes and a shining face. I met one yesterday, 91-year-old man on the street up in Nottingham. He was actually from France, I thought. I said, are you Polish? Do you have a Polish accent? He goes, I'm French. We talked. I go, you're French? He goes, Christ is coming back. I'm a believer also. I was so encouraged by that short encounter. But he said, I go, I thought he was 70 years old. I go, and we, we talked a little bit and he volunteered his age. He said, I'm 91. I go, you, are, you look amazing. You must have eternal life. <laughs> you know, the names of God, wonderful counselor. I need counsel. I need somebody to tell me how to live. I need somebody to correct me. I need somebody to yell at me a little bit every once in a while. I need to stay away from the poison, and especially the chocolate-covered poison. That's the real problem in this world. Uh, the sexy women that are seductive to men, and the women have the problem as well. And it is so delightful and titillating and seductive but it is poison. I've heard this phrase, what is it called? A working, you know, a working heroin addict, a functional heroin addict, a functional alcoholic. You've heard the white collar heroin addict, white collar alcoholic. And I was thinking of those words and I was thinking how important it is to understand there is no such thing. You may have your job, but that, does that, that drug will bite you. That drug will take your life. That drug, there is zero tolerance for these drugs and for alcohol in my mind. It'll get you. I've seen it happen. We need a counselor. What kind? This kind. Been there, done it. I went down to the bottom. 
I've been in the mud, in the slime. I've been in the place where death is. I have seen the devil. I know what a lie is. I know what destroys human beings. I am the counselor. I am the word of God. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the guy, the guy that's got the keys to death and hell. When death knocks on our door one day, we'll say, who is it? And the dead will look out through the little peephole. You know, the, the hood and the sickle is there. The reaper, the gri grim reaper has showed up. Honey, the grim reaper has showed up. She said, you, you can go. Tell him to go to hell. <laughs> I'd say, no. Christ has the keys to death and hell. Amen. I've been waiting for you, grim reaper. If it is God's time, I am ready. We are prepared. And there is nothing that you can say or do outside of our Christ who went down under that heavy burden, way down, and then he just kind of, he does it. And he gives to us, and this is the Greek word here, dia thik. That means you were not involved in the conditions of the covenant. They both mean covenant. But one of them is you are not involved in the conditions. Abraham fell asleep, but God kept the covenant with himself. God the Father in Christ walked in between those animal sacrifices while Abraham was sleeping. But notice something. Not only was he sleeping, but he had a nightmare. Could we put that verse back up there, Genesis 15, 12 for me? Genesis 15, isn't it for 15, 12? There it is, yeah. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness. He had a nightmare. Next time you have a nightmare, identify with Abraham. Say that nightmare cannot change the covenant that God has made with himself. That nightmare cannot change the condition of who it is that I am how I am born into his family, and my heavenly Father will take care of me. His name is uh, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. This covenant is with no conditions on our part, except we believe. That's it. We believe and we're born again. Now, we, we learn and we walk with him, but we are, we are grounded in peace, grounded in this grace, grounded in who Christ is. The man that took upon himself uh, humanity and came into this world to save us. And in saving, he has saved us. Okay. What can we say then? I'm amazed by it. I can't believe it. I'm so happy about it. I'm so needing to think about it and relate to it. I, I just am amazed by it. Paul writes all the time, it is an unspeakable gift. Oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? Oh, angels, what do you have to say about it? Both the elect angels and the fallen angels. The fallen angels are like in a Ponzi scheme. They are victims and they cannot get out of it. They, I heard, thought about Bernie Madoff who did a Ponzi scheme recently, you know, 10 years ago or whenever it was. And I was thinking the devil is like in a thing and he can't get out of it. He knows he can't stop. Just keep lying and keep lying and keep lying and keep lying. Don't you know that it's going to come to an end? I don't pay no attention. I just keep going and keep going. Many people do this as a way of life. They don't dare stop. They've been lying so long they cannot stop. They've been living it for themselves for so long they cannot stop. But let us listen and pay attention. There is another way. And that is, God, he came to save us. You're going to get it one day. Why not give it to Christ today? 
you, 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 will, you and I, we, one day the whole house comes tumbling down. Why not say, look at this, that he came into the world and he became sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God. He came into the world so we'd have a new name, a new nature, when there is no Ponzi scheme, no ripoff, there's no trap. We were caught in a trap and we have to keep going in our, in our downward, in our destructive bent, in our struggle with ourselves. No, he became sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God. He became cursed hanging on a tree so that we would not be cursed, but we'd be free. He was forsaken so we would not be forsaken. Wow. Uh, he is a good shepherd. That's another one, Ezekiel 34. The good shepherd, that's what is needed in this world. Look at it. Christ comes, goes all the way down, comes up, and there it is. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords at the Father's right hand forevermore. And in heaven, John saw nobody could take this script, the scroll with the seals. Nobody had a right to the title deed of the earth. In Revelation chapter 5, and John wept much, and he wept much because there was no man, there was no angel, there was no one qualified. Then the angel said to John, weep not, there is one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God. And out came Christ, and he took from the Father the title to the deed of the earth, and it means the government is on his shoulder now that Christ brings judgment to this earth. Christ will return and establishes his kingdom. And guess what? It's amazing. We will be in that kingdom. We will reign with him. We have that same spirit, Christ, in us. When there's a mess in our life, sometimes we go, oh, no. Oh, no, I don't want to get into that. Oh, no, I don't want to show up. I oh, know you mean I got to be in the church. I oh, know you mean I got to ask for forgiveness or I've got to lay down my life or I got to learn to be patient. Or, you mean I got to be with people that are different from me? I want to choose my friends. The Lord goes, no, for you to live is Christ. I need you in the mess. Get down in there. And Christ is the same. He's doing the same. He's doing the same in this world. He's the same Christ. He will do it forever. He'll never stop being a servant. He'll never stop being this way. He'll never stop. He'll never give up. He'll never lose any that the Father has given him. He'll never stop believing the Father, trusting the Father, serving. He'll never stop washing feet. He'll never stop as our high priest. He'll never stop offering up the blood, his blood, his own blood. It is eternal. It, he'll never stop being the Lamb of God. He'll never stop being our comforter, never stop being our everlasting Father. This is why a Christian home at Christmas time is different from pagan homes. This is why a Christian, Christian home, a loving home, Pastor Gary like, did this, you know, hi, hey, hi. Never a Christian home, the warmth of a spirit-filled home. Yeah, we all have our mess. But we also have Christ. And Christ turns beauty into ash, I mean, ashes into the beauty and the spirit of praise for the garment of heaviness. Christ is in our Christmas. If you take Christ out, okay, yeah, we have a good time maybe, but I mean, it rings hollow. If you take Christ out of my life, yeah, I can put on, I can pretend, but it's not the same when you take Christ out of a church, yeah, it operates, but it's not the same thing. 
We are here because we have spiritual hunger. We are here because we have seen Him. We are here because we have tasted the reality of His grace and His name and nature. We are pleased, blessed, and we are being prepared. Let's close by saying something about heaven. You know, I like to think of this picture. A boy is born in a cave. Um, let's draw a cave. Here's a, he's a, a little boy is born in the back, deep down in the back of a cave, and he's never seen nature as you see it when you're outside. And his parents teach him by writing on a, on a whiteboard or a chalkboard in the cave. And they write there, cow. And he looks, he's taught, cow, tree. He is taught about life outside the cave. They do their best drawing pictures on the board. And a little boy is there and he grows up and he understands that this is reality. We can call this reality number one because it is. The parents do their best. They are teaching him about life outside the cave. And then one day, at the right time, he comes out and he sees a real cow. What? Cow? cow. Are you kidding me? That is a cow. Stars, trees. Well, I think this is like the world we live in. I think we are being taught by God. In a way, in a very limited way, we are seeing. But it is true, that is a cow in the chalkboard. And the parents do the best they can. But also, there's a huge leap from a chalkboard cow to the real cow. And I think we are being prepared. And God is saying, you know, I didn't make you so that you would just live here, die, and pass away. I, I made you so that you would be like me. I made you that you would know me. You would know my nature and my love, my name. Do you know it? And we are able to say, Jesus said it, John 17. He said, Father, I have manifested your name to them. Father... They have seen you. They have seen your glory. Keep them. Protect them. Keep them. Father. Yes. We have seen Christ, so we have seen this operation and this work. And we are now living in our faith and we are not ashamed of what we see and what we understand and we are realizing that Christmas is an amazing celebration of the most amazing grandest miracle of all not only did God create the heavens and the earth but he came as a man and dwelt in them humbled himself made himself known to us in these small miracles that are kind of slowed down in small little packages. And we see a small miracle, he walks on the water. It's small not in terms of magnitude and profundity, but it is small in time and space. And then we look out the window and we say, whoa, every day. The universe is filled with his wonder. And then when we look at Christ, he brings it right home to us. And we say, yes, Lord, thank you for showing us who you are and making it clear to us. I had a la last thought, and this is a little long, but last thought. I was thinking of this, the, just to share it with you. I think it's kind of unique. An atheist is not suspicious. And then an atheist is suspicious. Just to think about it for a minute. 
what is it he's not suspicious of? The higher thought. He says there is no God. You, you must be crazy to say that. Why are you suspicious about that thought? Why are you asking the question, maybe I am wrong? Why can't you say, maybe there is a God? Why aren't you suspicious about it? Why are you so confident about it? And then paradoxically, when he talks to you and I, he's suspicious about us. He's suspicious about religion. He's suspicious about our faith. Well, this is for another message at another time, but I think it's fascinating. Yet, atheist has no excuse. That atheist is a man that one day will stand before God and have to give an answer. That man is lying. That man is not being honest, not being objective. That man has not found what it means to fear God. And if we fear him, we will know him, we will trust in him and believe in him. Amen. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Tonight, we want to give you an invitation to come to Christ. You should be suspicious of your own reasonings, of your own self. You and I, all of us actually, not just an atheist, but all of us should not be trusting in our own perceptions. But we should be putting our trust in the one that said, and he said it so clearly in clear preparation for his coming, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. You should be coming to him in faith and the fear of God that one day you will be accountable to God for everything you have said, everything that you have done. Every one of us, we would stand before the bar of God and be found guilty. But God so loved us that he gave his only begotten Son. And whoever is believing and trusting in him, then you will not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is why he came, not to destroy, but to save to lift the mass, to lift it up, to carry it, swaying back and forth on the good and heavy and strong sh shoulders of the living almighty God who can bear all things and do all things. Say to Christ, I believe in you. Say to him tonight, I believe in you. Raise your hand, please. Anyone at all, say, I believe in you, Jesus anyone at all. I believe in you, Jesus. On the internet, you must say it in your heart to God. I believe in you. I trust in you. Oh, yes. Thank you, Father, for this message and these meditations tonight for this great holiday season. Thank you for the body of Christ, what it means to love, what it means to serve. Thank you for showing us and that this is our life now, our new life. Though we sin and fail, we do, but we confess it to you. And you're so good because you gave not your son to condemn us, but to forgive us and give us great grace. If sin abounds, grace more abounds. He cannot lose his own. He keeps us. He saves us and keeps us by his son. His son did it. He did it. Amen. Could we have Scott come forward? And we'll, we'll have him stand right down here as we finish up. Pastor Steve, you want to help me? There we go. Or Brian. Brian. I know that many of you feel this way about Scott and know him and have seen him through the years. He has a, a degenerative a neurological disease that's genetically 
passed in his family. His dad passed from it, his brother, and he is relentlessly believing, and he is very committed and faithful. And because we're doing this because we all love him so much, we're in the family, and because he has showed us many things, maybe just down there is fine. You can, Scott, you can just feel it, sit on that step if you like. Um, Scott, we, we wrote a letter up and we framed it for him to give to him as a gift. We want to thank Scott for showing us so many things. He has exhibited a relentless spirit of courage. We've all seen him walk, swaying, going through the hallways, the cafeteria, sitting, smiling, loving. He is determined to live out his life in faith and great grace. Thanks, Scott. He refused to let his challenges and limitations keep him from driving around town, from faithfully attending church and lunch wraps, and singing with the Greater Grace Choir. Scott is known by his laugh and his ability to joke about himself and others, and he's never one to take offense.